Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us once again on the One Soccer. Everyone had a fantastic long weekend with their friends and loved ones. And great to be joined today by Rob Gale, the heading the show with us as well today for the next half an hour or so. Gentlemen, how are your Thanksgiving weekends? Rob, what was it like to spend a little bit of quality time with the family? Uh, excellent, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. Um, not a celebration that we have in England. We're all ungrateful, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, nice to celebrate in, in Canada and uh, spend some good time. I ate too much food, but uh, it was good. Ollie, can you confirm or deny that Thanksgiving sentiment? <laughs> I would know. We, well, we don't have it, but I, I like it as a holiday. It's like a pre-Christmas. Um, so you kind of get to double up twice in twice in two or three months. So I've been become quite a big fan of Thanksgiving, but yeah, not uh, not a thing in England. Wheels, you get to shed off all those turkey and stuffing pounds before Christmas and then do it all I, over again, eh? I'm a vegetarian, and for the first time, uh, I had a smoked watermelon. And it was in the form of a ham. Oh, and it was actually quite delicious. Honestly, it didn't taste like watermelon or ham. But uh, yeah, the vegetarian Thanksgiving, it's, it's one you don't want to miss. We don't have nearly enough time to dive into what makes a smoked watermelon. So let's talk some football because at least that's something I think the four of us can all contribute to. And Rob, we'll start with some pretty big news out of the Winnipeg camp with uh, Master Cash and uh, Andrew Jean-Baptiste re-upping already for 2021. Uh, just your immediate, well, I guess not so much immediate anymore, but your reaction to the signings and, and what you think that means in terms of a vote of confidence for this club. Um, yeah, we're delighted. Uh, we've got a lot more to announce. We're going to... Uh keep the fans uh, giving uh we'll be giving thanks and giving news to the fans i think once a week on people that are returning so there's lots more uh, uh, as part of our core for next year that obviously i know about and, and people will become aware of but um look i don't think anybody could argue with andrew jean baptiste quality before he came or or what he showed and obviously i think that was a big turning point for us in the halifax game when we lost him uh, otherwise, I, I fancied our chances heavily uh, to advance, to be honest. But um, yeah, him and also Master, great, great lad. And unlike most of the boys this year, they felt that we were starting to come into it more and more with each game played. Obviously, the Cavalry game was the, the very first game that we got these guys together with no preseason games, etc. So delighted to have them both uh, back with us. Great characters, great lads, first and foremost, great people. Uh, and terrific footballers. So I think uh, we're on the right lines. And as more details come across of who we're keeping uh, for next year, I think uh, you'll see that we're we're continuing to build. Well, you, you spoke a lot, obviously, on the calls and, and on the desk with us over the course of the Island Games about just how important Andrew Jean-Baptiste was to that roster. Do you think he is, as it stands, the top defender heading into 2021? If he's not the best, he's right up there. I thought that he was the, the the not only the best defender, but the best player at the Island Games before he went out through injury. And Rob can speak to the value of having not only an experienced player, but a center back that can play with both feet, that can play under the back, that's athletic, that is, is positionally sound and helps with the team structure. I just thought he was outstanding. And for me, it's an absolute coup, Rob, that uh, you and Valerie get to keep him in Winnipeg for the foreseeable. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, I think, um, you know what, he, he said it in his own report, but we trust him implicitly. He likes the culture and uh, the character and what we're trying to build and create, and he feels valued. And for any player of any age, that's that's so important. Uh, I'm an Arsenal fan, so we'll bring Meza Ozil on to confirm that. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the fact that there's not many left-footed central defenders out there as you guys can attest and especially in the league uh to have that ability like you say gareth to use both the equally hit that diagonal under pressure consistently uh he's terrific but what you don't know about andrew unless you work with him is just how positive a guy he is um and he's the first if if anybody sort of gets on each other in training or in a game he, he brings it up and he says you know, you know what we're only going to get anywhere if we stick together and you need leaders like that. You need people who are going to take accountability and hold other people accountable. Um, and he's every bit that leader for us, which is fantastic. 
Do you think? Um, how, uh, go ahead, Ollie. Sorry. Sorry, Adam. I was just going to ask. Do you think Robbie might have to fend off a bit of interest over the winter from from MLS and elsewhere, or is is that kind of yeah. is that door closed with the contract? No, uh, you know, one of the things I think as a coach who's worked predominantly in development and and working with players is is my interest and specialty really. Um, we'd never stand in his way if a better opportunity come. I don't think you can do that with any good conscience for any player that you work with. Um, so we expect interest. There has been initial conversations and interest. Uh, what's great is Andrew said, look, if if nothing comes around and if it's not right for him, he's happy to stay not just this next year, but for many years with us at the club. And he enjoyed the coaching staff. He enjoyed the culture. Uh, and he feels we've got a lot more to give, which I think we all do. I'm glad you hopped in there with a, a actual soccer question, Ollie, because I was just going to ask Rob if you thought Gunnar Soros or Vic the Lion would win on a, in a 1v1. <laughs> yeah, Gunnar Soros, he's, he's in the job <laughs> till January, maybe. What's going on there? Brilliant PR from me, but brilliant. It's day to day. Uh, Ollie, for you, back to football on the pitch and players not wearing furry costumes. You were around, obviously, the players and you had a, a direct line of vision and analysis on all these players that we weren't able to have just by virtue of you being with them for six weeks. So where would you rank Andrew John Baptiste in the top three players in the CPL? Because there's that's, I think, one of the strengths of this league is some of the center backs. Um, yeah, in terms of defenders, he's right up there. But I, I, like, I think there's a lot of good defenders in the league. It's probably one of the strongest positions when you look across the board at, you know, Didich and Edmondson's at Saw. Um, I thought Mayor Jaguer was good for Pacific. The Halifax guys, Charla and Jeff Rod, where, you know, there was a spell for four or five games where they were dominant. And then you look at, you know, what Forge do when it matters with with Edgar and Crutzen. And, you know, those guys are, can, can shut a game down as well. So I thought he was right up there when you combine... Um, you know, his, his ability on the ball, his athleticism, and also just the, the leadership qualities that he brought to Valor. I, th- I think he'd be in my top three, probably with, with Kritzen and Zator. Um, but leaving out, you know, Edgar and Didich, as I said, that, that's not easy. They're quality players as well. On the topic of top three, Rob, we've had this debate quite a lot on these hangouts just as soon as the tournament ended on who we thought the the MVP candidate or the MVP winner, excuse me, should be between Becker, Bustos and Garcia. Which way do you lean, Rob, or do you have a write-in candidate for us? Um, I mean, it's a tough one without being in the room with them and everything else, because uh, I think you can make arguments for each of them and what they mean to their team. Uh, over two years, Kyle Becker's been the best player in the league. I think that would be pretty unanimous. Uh, his consistency and what he brings to that team. Uh, if I was going purely on a tournament basis, then I don't think Halifax gets to the final without Akeem Garcia and the goals that he scores. Um, for me, he was the best centre forward in the t- tournament. Um, so it, it's a difficult one. And obviously, Boosty is a terrific player. He was our MVP in our first year, for sure, in my eyes. Um, I think he done well. He probably got better after the... The Valor game, I thought uh, he started to get into better positions and higher up the field uh, and then started to cause some real problems. So, you know, uh, I'll leave that to, to the other people to judge. And um, But you can make arguments for each of them uh, and what they meant to their team. If it's just on the tournament alone, I'll probably give it to Garcia because I think he had the most impact. Go right back to you in a second here, Rob, but just to get wheels in, um, what's your scouting report on Master Casher? We've obviously talked a lot about Andrew Jean-Baptiste, but let's focus a little bit more on the other signing that we know, uh, as Rob alluded to some more in the future, but what's the scouting report for you on Casher? Well, that he was just part of a collection of really good recruitment by Valor over the course of, of the offseason. I think that we were all asking ourselves, maybe Rob too, to a certain degree, what 15, 60 new players in the team would look like and how quickly they could come together. I think I think Chibaro was was part of that 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 group as well that that really impressed. So th- there's a number of players that stepped in, and, 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 and Masta was absolutely one of them. And I, I think that you can see the pieces of structure have come together. And 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 Rob will Rob will tell you this. I think a lot of other people will as well. If the injuries don't hit Valor the way that they did, they could have very well been in the final four. And for my money, the most entertaining match of the tournament to watch was the two-two against Forge in their last game when they were losing numbers by the minute in terms of players on the field, but able to hang in there and compete. I just think that he's part of a much more mature 
um, both on and off the field group of Valor players that look a, a much more complete unit. Rob, I'll let you respond to that directly. There's a lot in there to unpack. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was I was very confident in the group we brought together. I I I, uh, I said that early on. Um, I think you're going to see turnover in this league. It's inevitable. Uh, when I first spoke to uh, friends of mine and colleagues, Alan Coke, uh, you know the DeSantos brothers uh, about working in these leagues with salary caps, they said the thing you've got to be very careful of is you're not continually paying more each year for the same level of player. And that's a challenge mm. for all of us because everyone feels they deserve a pay raise. Everyone's agent feels, you know, they're one step away from the next level and you have to try and balance that. And, and sometimes you've got to be a little bit ruthless. I think you'll see it again in the off season, not with our club, but with others this year where there could be high turnovers, but we knew we needed to get bigger and stronger. Uh, we needed to be better on set pieces. We needed better. defensively chip and, and maturity and uh, Gareth's alluded to all of that so you know players uh, like Master who have had experience in the USL it's a big factor knowing how to play on turf different time zones different weather you know it, it, it's very challenging and some players coming into a new league uh, first-time professionals it's such a steep learning curve um, and they may come back and uh, they may go to different clubs and eventually blossom, but it's very, very challenging. And as a coach, you have to make some difficult decisions about letting people go and trying to bring in uh, talent with the budget that you have. So Master's a great guy, Brett Levi, Stefan Sabara, you know, all of these guys, Fraser Ed, experienced professionals, um, good ages for this league, uh, terrific talent, all of them Canadian, which I love. Um, so, you know, it was, it showed on the field, right? Yeah. Robin, there's no doubt that when we have such a nascent league, like the Canadian Premier League, when you're finishing one season and you're starting to ramp up for year number two, fans and media and everyone outside of a team specific environment only has one year to look at. And it's perhaps tough to forecast what's to come. So I think one of the biggest storylines especially for us in the media world was we saw players like Louis Bailon Goyet and Marco Bustos and Michael Petrasso decide to not continue to with this this Valor identity this Valor club why do you think that was and what do you think has changed in terms of mindset of the club going into a year where as you mentioned right off the top of our show it sounds like you have a lot of players who've already recommitted so early in the offseason nothing's changed in the mindset of the club um, it's the mindset of the players uh purely and simply each of those have different reasons uh marco i think you guys chronicled his every decision last year in the winter when he was making decisions uh his girlfriend's out in vancouver uh she she wanted to be there uh, michael has not lived at home since he was aged like 15 uh wanted to return back to york you know there's personal stories behind each and every one of these players um and, you know, whether they're football decisions, personal decisions, combinations of both, um, they're all great lads. You know, I, I said it in the game when Mike went off. Unfortunately, he didn't have a, a good tournament. Um, I don't think Louis was at his best or, or, you know, the same impact that he was for us. So you just hope that wherever they go or the decisions they make, they continue to grow as players and improve and and showcase themselves. And I think Marco's kept up the, the same sort of level he had uh, with us, especially late on in the tournament. Um, but I don't think there's any mindset change. We had a very clear one, three, five year plan as to what we are as a club. I spent a lot of my first year, I've gone on record as saying it as being the general manager more than the head coach. Uh, because if you don't get your foundation right and your structure, your connection to your community, the fan base, the the fan groups, uh, being seen out there front and center. I did over 150 plus engagements in that first year uh, with the Manitoba community. So that that's going to stand long, lot long longer than the results of the first year and the players we brought in. Uh, and for me, that's that's fundamental. If we want to be the league that we want to be, we want to be the franchise that we want to be. You have to have the bigger picture in mind and continue to build and, and develop and grow that. And I think we, we, we've done that well. 
Uh, and now we're, we're taking strides on the field. Uh, and our next evolution is to continue to that to make sure that we're competing for titles. Well, you've been busy in the offseason already with a lot of features on news.onesoccer.ca, breaking down some of the tournament and starting already to look ahead to 2021. So if the, not the main storyline for Valor heading into 20, what is their number one story heading into 21 for you? Um, I think well, it's, it probably depends, and, and Rob obviously knows more than we do on, on this right now. It, it depends how many guys come back, right? And I think we were all wondering, you know, what would Jean Baptiste come back? What about Julian Dunn? Um, and would they be in a position where, like last year, where they have to make a lot of changes again? Um, but if that's not the case, then that obviously completely changes the, the narrative. And Rob, I, I, I don't know how this offseason compares to the last one for you in the sense that maybe you can be a bit more kind of um, picky in terms of the players you bring in and, and look for kind of individuals who are going to make a difference now rather than needing to rebuild the whole spine of the team. Yeah, uh, you're spot on. It's um, it's not an overhaul of, of mentality or, or uh, personnel. It's uh, adding some top-level uh, talent right down the spine for me. Uh, you know, we we should have scored more goals than we did. Now Austin Ritchie has not ended up as a poor <laughs> goal scorer in the tournament. He, he doesn't know himself, you know, two off the line, keepers making great saves. Uh, we had some we had some great chances, but we got to create more. I think uh, looking at the stats, we had the most shots, but then we didn't have the most expected goal. So we had to rectify that. We need someone who can pick the lock at, at um, uh, a 10 and a 9 for me, uh, a real attacking talent, people who can get, you know, uh, Bums off seats, as we say. Uh, some extra dynamic in that final third is, is what we're looking to add. Maybe another piece right in the middle of the park as well. They're the three sort of major acquisitions in a diff, in addition to the talent that uh, we know that's returning. So uh, I think you're right. It's it's bide your time. Uh, I've said it before. Some of our best signings have been in the March uh, of each year. Um, because players come out of US um, via MLS or USL contracts or, or don't get the contract that they thought they were going to. And there's there's opportunity there. So we're going to be patient. Uh, obviously, we're working with the league and the 21st club and uh, the, the rules uh, around squad uh, acquisitions. Um, but it's tweaking now and finding really that high-end talent that will be difference makers, I think, that will catapult us into that top two. Adam, can, I, can I jump in? Can I jump in here really quickly? I, I was just, just to... about to ask if you wanted to, so please be yeah, my guest. <laughs> be, because it's not only adding those impact pieces, Rob, but we're in COVID right now. We're dealing with unprecedented, unprecedented times. And next year's calendar in terms of international football could be absolutely bananas just in terms of world cup qualifying gold cup qualifying gold cup olympic qualifying potentially the olympics as well i mean you could be losing players for extended periods of time so how do you go about like how complex is it building a squad you know not just for your team but across the league as well yeah i mean you you've hit on a few of the factors right there's so many there's so many intangibles there's so many things that you you consider you look to work through um playing partnerships on the field uh a key for me like if your two center backs are potentially going to be away for a, a month you know you better have the good third and the thought um who are you going to lose which key positions is it going to be your goalkeeper how do you deal with that you know where do you invest your money uh, when it's very limited, um, especially in a market like ours, that you you have to take all of these factors into consideration. So it's a, it's a complex jigsaw puzzle. But again, if I go back to what we want to be as a club and my vision of football and our philosophy for the game and our game model, then you build that anyway. You still have the, the picture on the box doesn't change. Right. You have to have that vision of where you want to get to in order to build that jigsaw puzzle. So we're going to continue to do that. Um, 
and look, you could have all the pieces there all the time, like we did for a part this year, and you get 19 players injured, 14 of those defensive injuries during games. All the best. Yeah, right. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Rob, this is just one um, that I wasn't going to ask, but just the, the line of questioning just sort of brought it up for me. Obviously, Valor and Forge specifically are in a pretty unique position being owned as well by a, a CFL franchise as well. And we've seen the, the difficulties they've had with COVID, especially considering the size of the roster and their travel and how you can't really bubble the CFL, for example. Um, so what sort of challenges is the wrong word, but what are some of the factors where you have that sort of ownership group in place that directly affect your ability to invest, as you say, and just do your job as general manager and head coach? Uh, I mean, I think every club has, you know, its own unique challenges uh, for each of uh, for each of us, and uh, we're a close knit bunch, so we we discuss a lot of this behind the scenes. But um, for us, it's just a case of, you know, stadium usage for training games. Um, obviously, this year it's been protection of staff and the health and safety of everybody involved. I mean, it literally forced, you know, uh, pay cuts. Um, people have lost their jobs, people have been laid off, you know, in the bigger picture, it, it, it's terrible. And for the CFL in its 90, you know, plus years to, to not be able to go just shows how, you know, drastic things are. And, and I think that's the, that's the challenge uh, for the ownership, for us in management, the same as on the bomber staff, making sure that, you know, you try and get a schedule that's conducive to, training and and what your ideal situation is but there's give and take on, on both sides and you have to be flexible um and adapt and, and 2020 again is the best year of that day but i was a canadian national team coach before that so we know all about <laughs> flexibility and adapting and dealing with budgets compared to your opponents so it gave me a good grounding you just take one day at a time there's no doubt that was the biggest thing missing from Thanksgiving weekend, aside from being able to have those bigger reunions, was the Labor Day Classic. So uh, obviously hoping the best for, for the CFL for next year. Rob, last week we had Jeff Paulus on the show, and obviously he made his news announcing that he was stepping away as head coach of the team. And he spoke candidly and quite frank and honest about the emotional tolls that being a professional head coach in the world of football bring uh, your reaction a to him stepping down and pivoting into a new role. And, and how much can you relate to what he was mentioning about just how difficult it can be to be the head coach of a pro team? Yeah. I mean, um, you can never judge a man, right. Until you've walked a mile in his moccasins, I think is the old uh, proverb. And uh, it's, um, it's tough. It's a challenge. I think Scott Parker's interview when Fulham got promoted was one of the best ones I've seen. You're away from your family, your friends this year, even more so. Um, you have to make sacrifices to reach a high level in any sport, uh, players, coaches, and to be in the game as long as I have. You know, it, it's tough. There's there's some lovely moments, but I think Gerard Julia said of his time coaching in over 40 years, he probably remembers five or six good moments. And that's, that's a reality, really, you know, and uh, Bobby's had two, so he's due about three or four more in the next 20 years, and that's his <laughs> three bugger. But I will say this about Jeff. Uh, I know him really well back from our NTC Prairies days when he used to come and help out as a developing coach and wash the laundry. He's, he's been an unbelievable servant to the game. He's a, he's a hilarious character, super dry humour. He's brilliant in the group chats. Um He's a top, top man, but he wasn't enjoying it. We talked about it last year, the challenge in going from youth football to senior football, uh, the demand that's on you, some of the scrutiny that gets placed on you. It's not for everybody, you know, and you can see that at every level, like people like Mourinho and others can thrive in that environment. And for others, it ages you quickly. And uh, it, 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 it's a it's a challenge. It's very difficult. I wish Jeff nothing but all the best. We're we'll stay in touch. He's a, he's a great friend, a good colleague, uh, you know, and he's done some great things there with FC Edmonton, and we'll continue to do so in the Alberta area. Um, so we're we're sorry to see him go for the banter alone, uh, but first and foremost, you you need to be getting up every day with a smile on your face and enjoying yourself and enjoying life. Otherwise, what's the point in it? Very well said. 
Ollie, who do you think on this topic has the toughest job right now in world football? You can take it in any different directions in terms of teams that don't have as much budget or top flight teams with seemingly all the pressure in the world. But who would your, who would your pick be for the toughest coaching gig in world soccer right now? Um, well, I think the, the favorite clubs of our guests here might, might be up there, Man United <laughs> and Arsenal, surely. I, I think anyone where you have um, you have expectations to be the best and to compete the, with the best, but you don't really have necessarily the club that's set up the way to do it right now, which I think could be said about Manchester United in particular. Um, you know, you could be the best manager in the world and, and still struggle in that situation. So, yeah, I'd probably go with United. Barcelona would be up there as well. They've been a mess for a few years. Um, a club like that, as, as much as, you know, you could go lower down the pyramid, I, I think being at the very top has is, is got to be the toughest, right? What do you think, Wheels? I'm guessing you agree with the United assessment? I, I'd love to, but I don't. I think it's <laughs> I think it's coaches that are dealing with much tighter budgets. I mean, United, and, and, and as much as I try to defend some of the method behind the madness, um, the amount of investment in that club and in that team is just incredible. The, the problem has been the way that they spend their money. Um, I think it's much more difficult for managers like Rob, you know, dealing with some of the smaller clubs in, in, uh, in club football across the world where their employees, they're, they're, they're not, beyond the players, the staff, the heartbeat of the club, you know, they're being furloughed or laid off right now. These are the toughest jobs for me because you're dealing with these people on an intimate basis on a daily basis. Um, so that's more challenging for me. I understand what, where all he's coming from, obviously the pressure and the spotlight, but if you're going to take a role like that, you have to be able to embrace it as well. It's part of it, right? You're, the criticism is going to come the highs, the lows, uh, you're, you're going to roll with it and you're paid handsomely to put up with that as well. So I, I think it's at the lower levels where it's far, far, far more difficult. Rob, anything further to add before we move on to our last topic of the day? You can say you have the toughest job if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, I'm I'm grateful to be doing something I love every single day. Um, there's a lot more people around the world worse off than me. I'm not going to complain about my lot. And uh, my brother-in-law works at Manchester United. They're, the one thing he says is he said it was the best organisation he's worked for. Uh, and he's worked many, many years across the spectrum in the UK. And he says it's the people that make the the, the club there. And that's one club we'd love to emulate to be like where people think we do things the right way internally with the quality of people we have in our organization so look there's no there's no easy job in football these days uh john herdman let's throw him into the equation right now <laughs> when everyone else is going out there and getting games we haven't got the budget to do so i've, I've walked a, a a small uh few yards in those shoes but not a mile but um it's very very challenging uh when you haven't got the resources of others and you're, and you're trying to compete. I, I know that firsthand. Rob, I think you're reading my mind today because you've perfectly segued me like three times into our next talking points. And the talk <laughs> about John Herdman takes us to our final chat of the day before we let you go. And that is the big year 2021 for Canada soccer for the men's side, at least. And especially with the women going back to the Olympics, uh, it's, it's make or break in a lot of ways for this men's national team of everything going on. And there is a lot, Rob, what do you think is the biggest story for Canada soccer in 2021? Yeah, I don't know if I'd say it's make or break because we've got 2026 on the horizon. So I think we can give some leniency there um, towards building that bigger picture. And again, that's something uh, having been involved in the association and the long-term planning with the youth, the DNA, everything we've tried to create. Um, look, it's, it's who knows what will happen. 2021 um can we keep players of, of the top level europeans that are out there the kyle larens alfonso davis jonathan david healthy um and available for selection as a national team coach that's never guaranteed uh the pressure at club level to stay and the finances there is very very difficult um i hope uh like we all do that uh, we can just continue to improve because we're knocking on the door uh, the aim was always to try and, you know, crack that top six. Uh, and we know that the U.S. and Mexico are ahead, probably Costa Rica. Uh, but can we compete regularly with the likes of Trinidad? We've done so well under Stephen. Um, Honduras, El Salvador, you know, uh, Costa Rica, all of these guys, Panama. It's 
it's not easy. CONCACAF is not easy. And until you've been there, you don't know how hard it is. You know, as an Englishman growing up, we wouldn't have paid it attention. We'd have put three points on the calendar and England are in the World Cup and you're playing a CONCACAF nation. It's not like that. It's, it's so very, very challenging and continues to grow as a nation under Vic's leadership as well and as a, as a region, sorry. So um, I'd love to see us qualify. I'd love to see us qualify for the Olympics. Um, the, the, let's not forget the female side of that too and them continuing to strive uh, and they're going to go under new leadership. So it, it's a big, big year. Uh, and you know what's beautiful about this though? Like it's the Canadian Premier League. It's the growth of the MLS. Soccer in the region is booming. Uh, that's why we get to talk about it and, and be involved every day. So it seems like every year is a, is a bigger year as we continue to grow. Are, are they going to hire a coach, the women's team? Do you have any scoop for us, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> I plead the fifth there. I've got. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do, Adam, do you mind if I ask Rob, uh, Rob one final question here? Because I, I, I want this on the record because we love watching Valor games. And tell me if this is true or not. Do you play to the camera? Do you know when the camera's <laughs> on you to give a little bit more of a fist pump? Like, it, it seems like you do. And, and honestly, your, your post-match discussions are must-listen to, must-see TV. I'm just wondering how much is calculated and how much is spur of the moment. Um, I did a media degree at university while I was still playing football. Uh, let's just say sometimes I, I do specific things, especially in, in comments afterwards to provoke discussion. Um, or, or put a specific point across. I don't think, if if, if we're honest, uh, there's no coach in professional football that doesn't. You need to sometimes bring points around or, or highlight certain things. Uh, I don't pay too much attention to cameras in games. Um, it's usually a response to something or someone uh, that's been brought to my attention. And then you just guys have so many cameras on me, uh, you probably catch it <laughs> good and bad. So, uh, but... Uh, I've been known to uh, to try and manipulate some conversation in the media. Ollie, was that be fair to say? Um, yeah, I think you know what you're doing, right? I I will add that um, the Valor Cavalry game, I think that was your first game, right, with uh, Rob on in one dugout and Tommy in the other one, was very entertaining to, to be at on the sideline for me. Uh, <laughs> so that was a nice way to start the Island Games. <laughs> We enjoy ourselves, and I've uh, known Tommy a long time as well. Great mate of mine. Yeah. It's always a chess match against Tommy. It's always enjoyable on the sideline. Um, yeah, sometimes we try and uh, bring things up to the referees about other teams' dugouts' behaviours and uh, <laughs> influence. But uh, we shake hands always afterwards. I think you'll always see that. And and, and the jabs at the pundits. Rob, I I, I mean, the, it brings about conversation. It, it, it really does. Is there one thing that bothers you more that people say? Is it being inaccurate? It, it, like, I know every coach has something different that they hear and it just sticks with them for whatever reason. What is it about the punditry or some of it that gets you fired up from time to time? I think we're an easy target. I'm going to absolutely be honest here, and it's it's easy. Uh, I'll compare us to York 9, and this is where I'll, I'll give you one. York 9, over two years, has won one more game of football than Valor Football Club. So go back across the record, look at it, and you'll see it. And the discussion last year, we were in third place with two games to go in the fall season, two games to go in the spring season, two games to go in the Island Games season, by the way, uh, I think we were still in third place or, or there or thereabouts. And uh, I think we're just a soft, easy target because we're Winnipeg and we're Manitoba. And um, I, I've talked about Ontario bias before. I think it's there. Um, I'll, I'll really? wait, to be, I wait to be proved wrong. But I think the discussion points, we didn't get a shot on goal against Cavalry. We were terrible. Edmonton didn't get a shot on goal against Cavalry. Oh, well, there's lots of building blocks. They played the tough two teams so far. It's the Ontario <laughs> bias for Edmonton. That's, why, that's yeah, what it is. I, I just think there's times when we're a soft, easy target and, and people can have a go at me because I, I have a bit of personality and I enjoy it. So I'm quite happy to, uh, to stir the pot uh, around those things. Uh, and just leave it out there for speculation. I heard there was a great big response after one comment, after one game, because even my family in England was saying, oh, you've, you've stirred up some good conversation in the one soccer studio. So that's what I'm here for. <laughs> love it, love it. 
I'm very relieved to hear that one soccer has gone worldwide and is a, a must watch in, in England as well. Yeah, uh, they they uh, they share the same sentiment as me. I'd just like to point that out, but they're, all, <laughs> they're heavily biased towards me and Tommy anyway, so that's fair. That's a wonderful spot to leave it. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving weekend, Rob, just want to say how thankful and grateful we are for you taking time to join us today. It was tough to book you before the season, but we really appreciate having you on now. All the best to you and your family, the boys, everyone associated with Valor FC. And thanks again for joining us today. All kidding aside, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for the invite. Uh, great pleasure. And uh, keep up the good work and keep the, the conversation on Canadian soccer because it's been long overdue. So thank you. Awesome. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. He is Rob Gale, head coach of Valor FC. Before you go, if you haven't already, make sure you like this video. Subscribe if you haven't on YouTube and all of our social media channels at One Soccer. More hangouts and more Oliver Platt features on news.onesoccer.ca coming soon. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you very soon from the One Soccer Hangout.